Hello, everybody. Welcome to uh, another R-rated series. This time we're looking at the newest MCU TV show, Hawkeye. Uh, and I'm really excited to get into this. The TV series have been pretty solid so far. Uh, we had WandaVision, which I think is still my favorite out of all of these. It was a really excellent start to uh, the MCU's TV series on Disney+. Plus. Uh, we had The Falcon and the Winter Soldier, which I didn't like as much, but was still pretty solid. And I thought it had some really interesting kind of nuanced character arcs and things going on there. And a really personal story for Sam Wilson. We had Loki after that, which surprisingly on the TV side of things wound up introducing the multiverse to uh, to the entirety of the MCU, which is pretty exciting. And then we had uh, What If, which wound up feeling like kind of a side anthology series, but actually seems like it's kind of building into its own thing. And I'll be curious if any of that impacts, you know, the MCU going forward from here. Uh, but now we have our fifth series. It's kind of wild. WandaVision was this year. It was still this year, 2021. And we've now got our fifth television series. That can't be right. I guess it is, right? Jesus. This has been a weird year, you guys. Uh, but yeah, so Hawkeye, starring Jeremy Renner as Clint Barton and Haley Steinfeld as Kate Bishop. Uh, really excited to get into this. Uh, so we're going to look at the first uh, episode. I almost called it issue. The first episode, Never Meet Your Heroes, which is going to be kind of our introduction to where these characters are at the start of this, especially in a post end game sort of world. Um, so right off the bat, I figure I'll talk some production stuff. Uh, I feel like I've been kind of spoiled over time because you can watch Infinity War on Disney Plus, and then you can go and watch one of these TV series on, on Disney Plus. And so far, none of the TV series have felt as high production as the movies, which makes sense. There's, there's for a TV, TV styled series, you're not going to get the same level of like intense, um, detail based filmmaking that you're going to get out of a movie, generally speaking. But like, there are certain elements of each of these shows that have felt a little on the cheaper side. Uh, WandaVision, the, uh, the visions flying felt a little bit off for some of those and his makeup didn't feel as, as convincing and Falcon and the Winter Soldier, you wound up with, uh, reused sets, like to a degree that it started making scenes confusing for Loki. A lot of the like weapon props felt really cheap and flimsy. And then for what if it was an animated one where they literally cut a whole episode out of it. So like, I'm hoping that we can get a little bit better quality production here, but I will note that uh, some of the visual effects going on in this are a little bit not great. Um, very early in the episode, we actually open on Kate Bishop when she's a child, um, around, I don't know, 10-ish, somewhere around there. And there's a point where uh, she, you know, it takes place essentially on the day of the Chitauri invasion. And she's walking through her massive, you know, brownstone penthouse thing that her that her parents own. And she goes and looks in a room and you see some of the, the Chitauri flying by the window and she screams. And then she comes out and then there's a big boom and suddenly there's a bunch of smoke and debris. And like the way they film it, one, the smoke is really obviously added in post. Like it's weird how, ob how much it stands out compared to other similar shots in the past. And also the camera keeps so tightly on her down the stairs and then holds when she goes into the other room that when she comes out and the camera pulls back and, ah, oh, there's all this stuff around, but it sounds like a sound effect. And it's pretty obvious that the, the debris that's on the ground was there before the shot started and they revealed it with the camera. And like, there's a lot of corners being cut that make it feel a little less genuine and a little less convincing. And it's, it's not the worst problem in the world, but it does kind of pull you out of it a little bit. Um, the ADR is also kind of weirdly weak in this episode, I noticed. Uh, there's a lot of points where the sound, like the tonal quality of the ADR does not match the action of the scene or its environment or or it's it just felt a little bit sloppy. It wasn't terrible, but it was definitely like kind of eh, a little a little iffy on that, I guess you could say. Um, there were also a few weird like especially more near the beginning than anywhere else but there were some shots that were that were essentially alternate angles of things going on during 
the events of the Avengers, the first Avengers movie. And there's a few camera pans that are really obviously like digital zooms and things. And like essentially this, the, the, the visual edit, the visual effects and the digital editing felt a little bit rushed on this one. I think with a little bit more time, it could have felt a little more polished. Um, it's a lot better than anything I could do. So it's not like I can I can be like, well, that was terrible. But it does it, you know, when you compare it to any of the movies, really, and um, you know, some of the other shows as well, it does it does stand out a little bit. Um, the intro animation for the series is pretty cool. You get kind of this look at Kate's life essentially growing up over the uh 11, 12 years between uh, the events of the Avengers and the present day um, where she decides to become an archer after seeing Hawkeye in action during during the Chitauri invasion. Uh, but she doesn't just train in that. She also winds up training in martial arts. She gets a black belt when she's 15. Uh, she seems to become like a gymnast and an athlete overall and a fencer and all of these things. Uh, and it's, it's like a cool little... It's definitely... Um, it might be the 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 intro sequence that is the most in service of the plot for for any of this um yeah and i'm and i'm just kind of thinking now too because there's no closing credit like there's there's closing credits but there's no like closing sequence and at first like i it was weird to me at first because all of the other shows have had kind of a closing thing but in hindsight now that i'm thinking about it more wandavision the Falcon and the Winter Soldier and Loki didn't really have an opening sequence. They would usually have a cold intro, the Marvel crawl, and then they would start, they would just jump into the episode. And then at the end, they would have like a big cinematic animatic thing that would, that would end with like the title of the show. But this show and what if opted instead for like really elaborate intro sequences instead. So like, it's just a different style. Um, I think it also kind of helped in a little mini miniature way too, because uh, Hawkeye is the only character out of the OG Avengers, the original six that doesn't get a movie of his own. Um, you know, Iron Man, Captain America, Thor, and even the, and even the Hulk wound up all getting their own movies very early on. And then black widow just got hers as part of phase four. Uh, and Hawkeye doesn't get that. He gets a series instead and jumping to those familiar styles of credits does give it a little bit more of a filmic feel. And it does make it feel a little bit more elevated like that. So maybe that's kind of at play here. I'm not really sure. Um, the, the only other thing I really have to say about the production stuff is that I see it seems like there's going to be so the story itself is set around Christmas, literally the week leading into Christmas. And there's a lot of like Christmassy, you know, decorations and there's a lot of Christmassy like, you know, feel and tone to everything. And there's a couple spots where they, you know, have their own um, renditions of classic Christmas time music. Uh, in particular, in this episode, we have a nice version of Carol of the Bells that I really like. Carol of the Bells, I'm a huge sucker for in particular, but I really like, um, you know, when when movies and shows have Christmassy music woven into their their score. Uh, and this one did a really cool job with that. Um, so, yeah, the music is cool. The intro sequence is pretty cool. The other production elements of this were a little bit on the weaker side. Um, anytime they were like CGI 3D uh, not not 3D, but like 3D elements, CGI, you know, that was added in. It is kind of obvious, like even outside of the suspension of disbelief element, like it does kind of stand out a little. Um, I'm hoping that improves a little over the course of the show. I'm not like expecting it to necessarily, but it was it was a it was kind of noticeable at the start of it. So not the best, um, you know, look going in uh, as far as placement and continuity and things. um. Uh, at the very beginning of this, like I said before, so Kate is living in a New York brownstone with her parents on the day that Chitori invade in 2012. And there's a point where a huge hole is blown in the wall and she looks outside off on the balcony and she sees the moment where Hawkeye is on the top of a building on the corner of it firing stuff and then does his jump and then does the little like... um the little grappling arrow that he swings into the building because he runs out. I think his quiver is empty at that point. Um, which one, 
uh, is a really cool establishing moment for Kate, because that's the one hero she sees up close is is Hawkeye. So it's cool that that's the connection that she's making here. And two, it does a really good job of of humanizing the Avengers a little bit, which is ironic because I know that Joss Whedon originally wanted to have a more human element added into uh, the Avengers. Uh, the waitress was going to wind up the the waitress that gets interviewed. Um, at the very end of the movie, who talks about Captain America was actually going to have a much larger, much larger like role in the movie in terms of like her being the focal point over and over again to get that on the ground human element. Um, they didn't want it going with that. I think that was probably for the best. Like Avengers was one where once you got into the actual battle in New York, uh, you did not need to be told what was going on at ground level anymore. Like you were kind of invested in the fight. And as soon as you start focusing on the collateral damage, you start winding up running into issues of like, yeah, but they blow shit up all the time. So why are we spending so much time navel gazing about it now? Um, but this being a separate work, you get to you get to use that same human element as the foundation for a new character. And that forms a nice little origin story for Kate Bishop. Uh, and the the best comparison I can make to this would be um, Batman versus Superman uh, or Batman v Superman I guess uh, the probably the most universally acclaimed little moment in like the whole DCEU being uh, in Batman v Superman the shot essentially of Bruce Wayne running towards what is functionally both coded as 9-11 and the apocalypse at the same time um, it's a really, really effective way of grounding that absurd, crazy alien beatdown fight while also being an extremely good char- uh, like establishing moment for Bruce Wayne when you have dozens of other people running from this like advancing wall of smoke and like we we all we all have our memories from 20 years ago that's not a very that's it's not a very subtle metaphor what's going on there but it is a very powerful statement on like everyone else is running away and bruce wayne is running into the cloud of of debris and smoke you know i think he he winds up grabbing like a little girl that's about to get like completely consumed by the smoke and like kind of protects her or whatever and is like looking up at all this crazy shit that's going on up there uh, and I think that was a really good way of introducing the character and also establishing kind of what the other side of this was. Well, everyone else was like, yeah, the battle fucking rocks. Like, yeah, here's the other side of that, though. And I think this does a similar thing. It gives you a chance to kind of see what other people were seeing in the midst of this battle. Uh, and also, you know, they got to show off that, that you know, Hawkeye was pretty cool during that battle, especially as someone who doesn't have powers in the explicit sense um, in the comics, I'm not sure if it's explicitly a super a superpower or if he just happens to be just that good at you know archery and aiming and shit. But um, so yeah, that's that's kind of our our setup moment there, and then everything else moves forward uh, another eleven or twelve years. So there's a thing that I'm a little bit annoyed with. So uh, uh at the well. Before we get into that, really briefly, I think it's cute that the bell tower at Kate's college uh, was rededicated in honor of Obadiah Stane uh, prior to the events of Iron Man uh, in 2006, which bold move pinning down an actual date for something related to Iron Man in the mid 2000s, because that is a minefield when trying to figure out the timeline of all of the the Marvel things. Iron Man 1 is in this the most ambiguous imaginable space where it's got like four years of flexibility when it could have happened based on what everything else says. Um, but it is kind of funny that that wound up being wound up being a thing there. Uh, so Stain Tower is the name of a of a bell and clock tower that gets destroyed by Kate Bishop. And, and that was kind of funny there. Um, and it's also cute that this show starts at Stain Tower where... We literally, in fact, come to think of it, one of the last things that you see, like, not not one of the last things you see, but in the middle of that introduction scene for Kate when she's a kid, she looks up at Stark Tower, and then you have that scene play itself out, and then once you've done the Marvel crawl, you come back, and then it's Stain Tower, and I think that's kind of a nice, like, 
back and forth on those. Anyway, we come to the present day. It says present day in big yellow letters. Uh, and we're panning around in New York and we see we're, we're zooming in on, I think, off Broadway. It's it's not qu- it's pretty close to 42nd Street, but it's not like on it. I don't think uh, where there is a musical that's that's, you know, being performed or whatever. But one of the signs, one of the electronic billboards that's right there says Merry Christmas. And then in parentheses and welcome back, which to me says, oh, this is the first Christmas since the blip when everybody came back. So this is presumably December 2023. Apparently, that is not the case, according to director Reese Thomas, who stated that not only not only is this actually in 2024, but also the original plan was to make it 2025, uh, which, one, it doesn't make sense. Like, I'm trying to imagine... If COVID ended, you know, two months ago, would next Christmas there be ads about, yeah, it's great to come back to the to the world for Christmas. And it's like, well, no, we probably would have gotten we probably would have gotten those out this year. Right. We wouldn't really be reminding people for the second year in a row of the bad thing if we could avoid it. But yeah, so so I guess it's 2024. Um, But also on top of that, the ambiguity I guess the seeming ambiguity of all this makes me nervous about how all these things are going to tie together in the end because so far nothing has been related to anything else we've had four movies no three movies and five now TV shows and none of them have tied together I'm trying to think real quick if any of them have I know WandaVision is going to tie into uh, um, Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness there were murmurs that Loki would also and it's all but guaranteed that Spider-Man is going to have some kind of impact there too so like Doctor Strange will be the first like real like nexus point for lack of a better term of you know where all these things start to reconnect again but we're now on our eighth piece of phase four that doesn't tie into anything else i guess actually that's not true the first connection was um was val who was at in the end episode or two of the falcon of the winter soldier and showed up in the stinger to black widow other than that and actually i think i guess there was also in the stinger to black widow um yelena is now targeting hawkeye so that may come up later in the show. I've only seen one episode so far at the time of recording. I know that the third episode is now out. Um, I've only seen the first. I know nothing else about the other two episodes. So um, we'll see how those go, I guess. Um, but yeah, like all of this feels so separate and I'm worried about how it's all going to tie together in the end. Maybe there's like three or four pieces that are like w- hidden threads that are being planned that all tie back together or something. I'm not, I'm not really sure. Um, but it does feel a little bit spread apart right now, but anyway, so this is a billboard that we see outside of a musical that's being performed. And this is kind of maybe the most important thing of the episode in terms of like an establishing moment for Hawkeye. And that is this musical is called Rogers, the musical, which is so weird because like it's unclear if it's a chronicle of the life of Steve Rogers from start to finish or what, but we, when we show up, they're doing a big song and dance show stopping number, like about the Chitauri invasion and the seven Avengers that were there because for some reason, Ant-Man has been added into this and he looks, he, he doesn't have an outfit that even remotely resembles Ant-Man. I don't know what the deal is with that. Uh, Hawkeye makes fun of it at one point in the crowd. Um, But yeah, Uh, my big question here is, uh, well, first of all, this is definitely the like boy in the iceberg moment of the show. I feel like any, any series or franchise and the MCU can qualify as like a series or franchise here. Any series or franchise that goes on long enough nowadays post 2010 is like guaranteed to eventually parody itself in some degree. And this is that Rogers, the musical is very much the 
stage production. And I guess it's not even the first one we've done. It's not even the first fake Thor we've had because we had uh, the play. Oh, my God. What was it called? The the tale of Loki, the prince of Asgard, whatever the hell Loki's little stage show that he had going on, which was a dramatization of the events of Thor, the dark world. So now we have a stage musical of at least the events of the Avengers. So we've now had two separate fake Thors. Uh, and if you, if you ask Spider-Man, then there's been three because he had the guy in the Thor mask in, in that one uh, bank, you know, ATM robbery that was going on. But yeah, so it's an intentionally bad, hammed up uh, musical. And it's done in a way that intentionally makes musical theater like look as dorky as it possibly can. And, you know, there's a part of me that always kind of enjoys it. And there's a part of me that always is like, oh, come on. Because, like, I do like I do like the odd musical here and there. And I've done plenty of theater myself. So, like, I have an appreciation for, like, musical and non-musical theater and stuff. But it's like, I've yet to, like, ever, ever see a musical in another work that was actually treated seriously. Every single one that I can think of that's a stage show even, not even just a musical, is always played as a joke. Um, and even some of the examples that I could give, I'm just like, I don't want to give that example. That sucks. But like, not not for my point, but I just don't want to give the example. But the point being, uh, yeah, it looks really rough. The song, the lyrics are horrible. Oh my God. I'm sure they were written that way on purpose, but the lyrics are incredibly bad. It's like, essentially here's what I can do. Here's what the Hulk can do. Here's what Thor can do. Like it's one line things and it's, it's incredibly, incredibly shit. My one actual criticism, like taking it seriously for a moment. My one real criticism of the joke of the bad musical is that when we enter into there and we see the Avengers up on the top for the first time, Steve like belts out this one line and I forget what I forget what the actual like end of the chorus is, but it's delivered as if it's the last note of the song. And then the song keeps going for another like solid minute or two while, you know, we bounce back and forth between the stage and not the stage. And then later on into that, he delivers that same intensity of, of a finale to it with other people. And it's like, Oh, we probably, we probably should have made those like noticeably different in terms of intensity to make that sell a little better as legitimate. But again, it's intentionally a bad musical. So there's that. So here's the thing. Uh, Hawkeye is in the audience watching with his three kids while they're in New York just before Christmas. Why the fuck? Why? Why would he ever go see this musical ever? Why would he do this to himself? Why? Not just one. Why would he want? Why would he ever? He doesn't seem like he at all gives a shit about a dramatization of his own life, which fair. Two, why would he ever want to relive in any capacity the invasion of New York? Three, why would he want to be reminded of Natasha's death like this? Like, it's obviously there's a moment where he actively starts, like, really just kind of zoning out because he's, like, like, it's affecting him this much. And it's like, yeah, why would you ever show up to this thing? The internet exists. It'd be very easy to get a brief synopsis of what's going to happen here and then go, actually, I definitely don't want to be at this musical that is about maybe my second or third worst experience I ever had to deal with. I think I'm going to pass on that. Um, so there we go. But in addition to all this, we get a couple We get a couple interesting things here. One, uh, it feels like Hawkeye is starting to feel like he needs to confront his mortality, I guess. Like, this is kind of an extension of some of the stuff we got from him in Age of Ultron, where one of the big recurring character beats for him is that, you know, he's trying to sort of be the heart of the team. Like, he can't do the same things that the other ones can, but he can try to keep the team together. And, like... I like what I like what they were going for with that. It felt like lip service and it felt like they were actively baiting the audience into expecting Hawkeye was going to die in Age of Ultron, but uh 
the point being they they put that out there as like being a concern of his and one that and one that his wife Laura was kind of like talking over with him like hey yeah you you can't do the things that they can do which is why you're important you need to be their anchor essentially to keep them grounded and to like keep them like thinking straight about all this stuff and it's like okay i get what you're going for not presented in the best way but like all right and here we're getting and actually we, we we get an echo of that when he talks with wanda in you know later on in the movie and he's just like we're fighting, we're, you know, the world, the, this country is getting lifted up in the air. We're fighting a bunch of deadly robots and I got a bow and arrow. None of this makes sense. Like, but he's like, but I'm still going to go out there cause it's my job and I have to do it. And it's like, okay, here we are seeing kind of almost like a, not like a burnout exactly. Cause it's not like he's been active, but it's that same kind of exhaustion with this being now a constant in his life. It's now been 12 years of, hey, you saved New York and it was this awful thing and we're never going to let you forget about that and live it down. And it's just like a big, powerful thing. And like while he's in the audience, we find out that he's actually got a hearing aid at, uh, at this point. And we don't know a lot about it yet. I'm sure we'll hear a little bit more about what the what the deal with that is. But like He's, you know, it's unclear how old he is. He doesn't seem like he's, you know, particularly old, but he's probably, you know, in his 40s, at least at this point. He's probably like maybe in his maybe in his 50s, I guess. I'm not really sure uh, when he when he would have been born. He's probably this. He's probably like late 40s at this point. Um yeah, mid late forties, something like that. But the point being is like, you know, he's not gonna be able to do this forever and he's starting to get tired and when we're seeing between like we're seeing in a bunch of these in a bunch of these movies and shows there have been a ton of movies and tv shows and documentaries made about tony stark and about steve rogers and the two of them just the two of the the legacy of the two of them along with the actual impossible stature and strength of the Hulk and Thor just tower over Clint and Natasha and now Natasha's dead so Clint feels really small and really alone and really overwhelmed by having to live with this because Bruce Banner you know pulled himself out of his funk and he's doing and he's doing great and he's kind of leveled himself out and we're gonna be seeing more of him and She-Hulk uh, and Thor is off world would, and Tony's dead and Steve, no one's entirely sure. Um, it sounds like, so Clint is just kind of alone at this point. He can probably call Bruce if he like really wanted to, you know, rehash some old times or whatever, but he's by himself and he feels kind of small and we're getting like, it's a good way of kind of hammering in his mental space here. And I think that's kind of an interesting way of, of doing all of that. And in addition to all of this, we we probably this is you know something that I wound up talking with someone online about today and it feels really relevant here and I don't think I've brought it up in one of these reviews yet but the snap is retroactively a really powerful and unfortunately useful allegory for COVID and collective trauma in general uh, I am not a medical expert. I'm not going to pretend to be. So please don't like take any of this as being, you know, more than just a guy riffing and thinking out loud, I guess. But um, there's been some, in my opinion, clear coding in the in the more recent productions, the ones that were being, you know, actively put together still in 2020 and beyond of the snap having a similar collective traumatic effect as COVID does in the real world, which makes sense that would fuck a lot of people up. Um, and it serves as a useful literary parallel in the sense that like characters reacting to that can react in a way that feels like it could just as easily be related to real world events. And it slots in very seamlessly. And we wind up kind of being able to use some shorthand that f we're going to be familiar with as a result. Um, for example, during the five years between the snap and the blip, Clint Barton kind of degraded mentally 
to the point where he took on an entirely new persona called the Ronin, who, as we find out in this, actually wound up eliminating almost the entirety of New York's uh, uh, criminal underbelly before moving on to Japan to do the same to the Yakuza. So, like, he just kind of became this really destructive, vengeful guy. And in the aftermath, once the blip happened and Thanos was dealt with and all of that, we wind up seeing him kind of conflicted about that five years for himself. He seems to like, he winds up seeing someone, uh, you know, wearing essentially his old Ronin outfit. And he's like really disturbed by this and immediately springs into action. being like, I need to stop whoever the fuck this is immediately. Uh, similarly at the show, in the bathroom, he sees some some now rather infamous uh, Sharpie graffiti that just says Thanos was right, which, eh, like, it's a weak reuse of an extremely old meme at this point. But it does serve a kind of purpose here where when really bad stuff like what is going on right now happens, there is always going to be some contingent of people who feel like or are convinced into thinking that the bad thing was somehow cosmically deserved or that the bad thing is actually a good thing because X, Y, Z. So we're playing off of a mimetic false ish. I mean, who knows really thing that people in the real world did online that essentially was, you know, pantomiming the idea of Thanos's decimation of the universe as actually a good thing for whatever reason and and you know we get this idea that in the marvel universe there are people who feel bitter about it either because they found a different purpose in life in that five years and have had to revert or they've had to deal with choices they made that they now have to reevaluate or there are people who were in like a bad mental space who were really affected by it including some people who may have disappeared and come back and been like, this is so much weirder and worse. So I don't know. That was it's it's a moment that a lot of people have kind of made jokes about in the show. Uh, but I don't know. I feel like the parallel does some service to like kind of driving that kind of point in there that like, hey, this is kind of the state that this world is at, even I guess over a year later, and I don't know. I think I think there's more depth to it. I think they could have done it a little a little bit better, maybe, than using the literal meme name itself. But I think that that was still kind of an interesting and, and neat kind of thing to try looking at. They didn't explore it at all. I'm kind of hoping we wind up because it's basically, in some ways, the the um. Oh, I forget the name of them now. Uh, the the group from the Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Um, oh, I just had it and I lost it. Nope, lost it. Uh, that group also kind of is really upset about, you know, they were upset about people, you know, disappearing, but they're even more upset about like what the end result is is now that everyone is back and there's even less to go around and, and all of that. So like, I would like to see them explore this a little bit more. If they're going to bring it up, they should really take some time and get into it. I think they really need to actually like get in there. Um, all of that said, uh, the acting in this episode is pretty spot on actually. Um, I don't think there was any performance that stood out to me as being bad. Um, even like the, the actors playing the kids throughout this episode, I think there were four child actors in here. There were, uh, Hawkeye's three kids and also Armand Duquesne, the seventh, uh, all of them are fine. Uh, and that's usually the easiest spot to pinpoint a, a bad performance for better, or for worse. Uh, Jeremy Renner is doing an awesome job as a really worn down and tired Hawkeye. And I feel like that's going to be his main vibe for this entire series is he's just a fucking tired old man. And he's getting kind of sick of this and he's trying to bury this ghost from his past. And I feel like the end result of this show 
is that he is going to pass on the mantle of Hawkeye to Kate Bishop, which is a thing that more or less happens in the comics. I don't know a ton about Kate Bishop in the comics, but she is a Hawkeye in the comics. Um, Haley Steinfeld is rocking it in this show so far. I was a, a big fan of the energy she's bringing to this. Um, she's not as quippy as a lot of other characters have been in the past, but she does think on her feet really quickly, which I like. Um, including my favorite variation on, do you even know who I am that I've seen in ages? So if you're not familiar, uh, there, I don't know which one came out first, but there's a, com- a TV commercial from, I think another country and the movie slackers with, uh, with, I think Devin Sewa, I think. And, it's uh, uh, there's a, a character who is taking an exam and there it's in a big college lecture hall or whatever. And the professor's like time. That's time. Everyone bring it down. Yes. Yep. Yep. Nope. Time. And then they're still up there just scribbling away and they take an extra like minute or two while everyone else is filtering out and they deliver and they deliver their thing. And they're like, I'm going to have to give you a zero. You're late. And the student says, do you know who I am? And the professor says, I have no idea who you are. And he goes, good and he just takes a bunch of the a bunch of the like blue books and just mixes them up and goes boom have a good day and leaves because if he doesn't know who he is then he has no way of being able to identify which one he is in the stack either so like that's a fun little thing there i've seen a lot of takes on that that are basically the exact same joke like same delivery same joke same punchline it gets old after a while this one does something a little different uh because Kate sneaks into, she doesn't know it at the time, but it turns out to be a black market auction. Uh, and she tells the other, you know, waiter guy that's down there. She's, she's dressed in like a black tux, black suit, black or black shirt, black tie. So she happens to blend in really well with the wait staff, which they actually set up earlier in the scene, which is, which is pretty good, um, you know, set up and delivery on that. Uh, and she tells, you know, she tells the uh, the other waiter, the other waiter's like, I thought I was the only one who was supposed to be down here. And he's like, well, Gary sent me down here. So, you know, he goes, oh, okay. And then two minutes later, Gary shows up and is like, yeah, I'm Gary. And and he's like, you're in real trouble right now. And she says, "What? do you even, uh, do you even know who I am? And he goes like, what? And he's like, oh, well, I quit. And like, she leaves and I'm delivering it super badly. But like the idea being, she feigns being like super upset and then quits and it's just enough to confuse him long enough for her to slip away through like the wine racks and stuff. It's a really good delivery. I'm doing a huge disservice to it here. It's the best version of the, do you know who I am that I've seen in years? Um, she's also coming off an incredible 2018 between, uh, the, the movie Bumblebee and also playing spider Gwen in the, uh, the spider verse movie. Uh, so she's hopping in here with a lot of, with a lot of that cred and among a bunch of other things too, like not to, not to, you know, bury the rest of the rest of her career. Um, but Kate has been a pretty fun and entertaining lead so far. She gets a little bit Gabby at times, but it's not like totally over the line. And it seems to happen more when she's like nervous which is kind of a fun character trait because she's a lot quieter and a little bit more like grumpily monologuing to herself when she's not nervous. So it's like a nice little kind of um, two dimensionality to to that aspect of her, which I kind of like. Um, by the end of the episode, Kate and Clint have crossed paths and are now confronting each other. And they're probably going to do essentially the not buddy cop thing, but like, you know, similar to that. I think she's going to be the like high energy, uh, like loud kind of like busy one while he's going to be the more like stoic, grumpy, annoyed one of the two. And they're going to have to work together to deal with, you know, the problems that are coming here. Um, there's also, Oh, there's also this other character named, uh, so Armand Duquesne, the third, who is an old man who looks to be like, 70 in his 70s maybe uh which makes armand the seventh being i don't know nine or so maybe maybe a little older uh i don't know how that works out technically speaking you can be a third for you can be a second third four fifth sixth whatever whatever without being the son of the previous numbered name it's just you know 
strictly speaking, if your father is named Jack, you could be Jack. You would be you would be junior if you are the son of them. But like you could also be Jack the second. But also if you then have a, a cousin who gets born, you know, essentially, if you have the same if you're, if you're naming after the same person, you could wind up having that crossover cousins and things. It gets very confusing. They delivered in a very weird way in this. But anyway, Armand the third uh, introduces himself pretty warmly to Kate and then straight up insults her mother to her face and then winds up threatening her mother behind not closed doors later and then participates in the black market auction and then he's dead. So who gives a fuck? Uh, yeah. Anyway, the auction includes uh, the Ronin sword which gets bought for just south of half a million dollars. And then the Ronin suit, which is about to get sold when a big truck thing bursts through the basement wall and out jumps a bunch of like European, like Eastern European, Russian mobster goons in in track suits um, looking for a watch, which I don't know if the, so the getaway driver says he's got the watch and then a one-eyed dog bites his leg and he falls over and then, you know, the dog runs and, and Kate sees this and runs after wearing the wearing now the Ronin suit. Uh, and I'm not sure where the watch is. It was actually kind of unclear what happened to the watch there. So I, I don't know. Um, but anyway, yeah, uh, I think that they do an interesting job of framing both of our main characters as being uh, discontented, discontented, discontent, discontent is a noun, discontented. Uh, and a little like uncomfortable in their lives. Clint seems to generally be like confused and a little bit, a little just kind of like tired and doesn't really like the way he's viewed by the world. He gets his dinner with the kids comped by the restaurant as thanks for saving New York. And he seems really uncomfortable about that. And it's not just like, oh, I'm embarrassed because, you know, it's just kind of like, I just want to have a normal life again at this point i'm retired but i can't get away from it now whereas kate who grew up rich she had very rich parents though there's some like murmuring going on like at the beginning of the show that they're running out of money and then the second show uh the second show and then later on uh it sounds like the business that her mother has may not actually be all it's cracked up to be or something like there's something going on under the surface Uh, but she comes from like a really rich background and she's kind of bored with that life, which is like first world problems, man. But like, they're both kind of not comfortable with where, with their like lot in life and what they've got going on right now. And I think that's going to be kind of a bonding thing for the two of them. Like, I think they'll find some common ground over just this like discontent with their lives. Um, I love that she has a bit more of a parkour vibe to her um that's something that i really like seeing in like not superhero characters per se but like i just like seeing that in action characters being able to have a little bit more of that going on and it makes her feel more dynamic and it it adds to like she's got a bit more of a stealth thing going on not very good at it but she does try um and i'm hoping to see a bit more of that there as well um yeah so I, I I think this episode does a really good job of establishing these characters. It feels it it does the same thing that the first episode of um of the Falcon of the Winter Soldier does, where you're kind of having the setup of the two characters and you can see them kind of coming together I, I think better than they did in Falcon the Winter Soldier. Um especially because these two characters don't know each other, whereas Falcon and the Winter Soldier, they knew each other. So, like, there was there were elements of this that's like, you guys should have really, like, come together much sooner than this. But it's, it, the actions of Kate are what draw Clint to interfere and intervene. And uh, I'm really interested to see where these go from here. Um, I think... Hmm. I usually have a pretty firm idea of what I want to give as a number for these before I start the video. And I thought I did. Um, I think I would give this episode. 
I'm stuck between a six and a seven. Um, it's a pretty, you know, like as I'm discussing it now, there's a lot of like, I didn't, I didn't really like, there's a lot more plot going on, but at that point I'm just kind of walking you through the episode. Uh, I just wanted to kind of give you a more top down view of all of this. I think I'll give it a seven. I'm going to give it a seven. It was pretty solid. Um, I think that the WandaVision first episode is still a better seven, but I think this is still a seven. I think it does an effective job of setting things up. And by the end of the first episode, our characters now have a conflict. It's a minor one, but they have a conflict that is setting them on their path. I assume by the end of the second episode, we're going to have a much clearer idea of where the series is going to go. Um, so yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to, cause what did I give the other openings? Yeah. WandaVision, I gave a seven to its, to its first episode. Falcon, the winter soldier, I gave a five. Uh, what if uh, uh, Loki, I gave a seven. What if I gave a six? I'd give this a seven. Yeah. I'm going to give this a seven. Um, thoughts on where this stuff is going. I think this, <coughs> the hashtag tracksuit mafia is going to be a kind of constant annoyance for the two of them. I don't think they're going to be the main threat, but I think they're going to be kind of the team rocket goon squad that we're going to be dealing with over the course of this show. Um, I have no idea who this watch belonged to. Um, it could be, it doesn't look, it doesn't look fancy or swanky enough or techy enough to be Tony's. And it, it's a men's style watch. So I'd be surprised if it was Natasha's. Um, so I really don't know because it was recovered from the Avengers compound, right? So like, I don't see Bucky wearing a watch. Uh, I don't think that, I mean, it could be Sam. I'd be surprised if it was Sam. Same if it wound up being, uh, you know, uh, roadies or anything. Like, I don't know who's wearing watches walking around there. So maybe it is Tony's. I don't know. He's the only one who seems like he'd care enough about watches compared to basically everybody else that would wind up being there. Um, maybe Bruce, I don't know, but I'm very curious how that's going to factor into this. I hope it's like a special watch and not just a watch, you know, um, the reemergence. I think we're going to see the reemergence of that criminal underbelly. Like there were obvious kind of winks to the camera that the Duquesne family, which, uh, one of them is, is now engaged to Kate's mom, who is a widow, uh, her dad died during the like uh, Chitauri invasion. Uh, it seems like that's going to be kind of a, a new rising threat. Maybe it's a gang war thing. Maybe we're going to see like, I mean, I'd be surprised, but it'd be neat if like the Kingpin showed up in this, whether it was Vincent D'Onofrio or an entirely new Kingpin. I hope it's Vincent D'Onofrio. If they do, they really nailed the casting on that one. He's so good. Um, but it'd be kind of neat if, if that was a thing there. Also, it kind of begs the question of like, if Kingpin exists in the MCU, because the daredevil shows are now kind of questionable as to whether they are actually part of the MCU. Um, I would be surprised. I, I guess, I guess the daredevil seasons all take place before. I also haven't seen daredevil season three. So if there's more stuff going on with Kingpin there, I don't know, but uh, that all happens before end game. So I don't know. Um, like I said before, I would be, I would expect that the end of this show is going to involve Clint passing on the mantle of Hawkeye to Kate. The logo for this show, I believe is the same logo used in Kate Bishop's Hawkeye comic series. So it does seem like they're kind of leading us in that direction. Uh, which would be interesting because it means that we have a new Captain America. It means we have a new Hawkeye. We have a new, um, we sort of have a new Black Widow, but she's currently being fielded by Val and her, you know, Dark Avengers or whatever. Um, we're going to have Ironheart. Uh, so that's going to be, that's going to be a thing. And we're going to have She-Hulk. And we're actually, yeah, and we're also going to have Jane Foster as, as a Thor, however they do that in Thor Love and Thunder. So there's a part of me that's kind of hoping that by the time Phase 4 is done, we have a new set of the original six in there in some capacity. I think that'd be kind of fun if they did something with that. But anyway, I think this is a solid start for the show. I had a really good time with it. Um, I love the Christmassy vibes. I'm always a sucker for that. It's our second Christmas set movie. Um, it's also... 
because uh, I think uh, Iron Man three takes place at Christmas twenty twelve. So now this is twelve years later around Christmas. So this this could be pretty fun. I think it'll be pretty cool. Uh, plus New York at Christmas is a really like iconic kind of look too. So I think that'll be that'll be fun. I would love to hear what you guys think of the show so far. Uh, tomorrow I'm going to have episode two and Friday I'm going to have episode three as reviews and we'll be all caught up to then continue in the following week into episode four. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm really looking forward to this. It's our last show for the year and I will be covering uh, Spider-Man No Way Home when that comes out as well. Um, and then we'll be done until sometime in 2022. I don't think they've actually said just yet when uh, any of next year's shows are coming out. We know Ms. Marvel is coming out in the summer, but the question is whether like Moon Knight or She-Hulk or any of those are coming out before then. And I don't have anything written down that says so. And we get Doctor Strange in May. So the question is whether something else is going to happen before then. I don't know. But thank you guys for watching. I've dragged out the ending as I always do. Feel free to like, comment, subscribe. Uh, give your thoughts below. I'd really love to hear what you think of this episode and the acting so far. I think Haley Steinfeld is a really great addition to the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Um, yeah, feel free to share this around too. I would love to uh, and feedback on these review styles. I'm trying to, I'm trying to focus them a bit. I still get kind of motor mouthy. I don't really edit these down. I have my categories of things I want to talk about. Uh, and yeah, I'm trying to I'm trying to make sure that I'm not just rehashing the whole episode in time. So we'll see. Uh, we'll see if we get better with that, too. Uh, yeah. See you tomorrow for uh, episode two. Have a good one. Bye.